All righty. Um, let's do this. So, uh, you guys watch that Canyon Arrow song thing? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it's 12, 12, it's 12 yards long. I, I, I missed, I, I, I gave off random numbers last time, but it's 12 yards long, two lanes wide, it's 65 tons. So that's of American Pride. Yeah, that's, um, it's pretty big. I was thinking, well, I was trying to think like, okay, 12 yards, okay, so 12, a yard is three feet, which is about 0.9 meters. So it's about a meter. So it's, you know, so then um, it's about that, you know, 30, 30 40 feet long, uh, which is, I don't know, how long is it? The longest outrageous, like the, the full on Chevy Suburban is, it's probably like 20 feet long or something like that. So, I mean, it, it's bigger probably than any reasonable car, but but not by modern standards by a, a huge margin. Um, I'm just saying like in terms of like cards that are actually exist. Um, and that's two lanes wide, obviously that's too wide. Uh, but I was thinking whether <clears throat> that implies like given a standard card density, does it, should it be 65 tons or should it, cause you know, these things can scale up cubically. So um, like if it was twice as long as and twice as wide and twice as tall, then it should be eight times larger than a standard car. I think um, cars, I mean, uh, cars are on the order of, of a ton, I think, or two maybe. So somehow it's much denser. I don't know what's going on in terms of the, the weight, but um, what can you do? Uh, so yeah, I hope if you didn't watch it, I would check it out, Canyon Arrow. Um, yeah, I also took the opportunity to, there's another funny song um, from, from a while back uh, where they had a Planet of the Apes episode and uh, and uh, well it's it's sort of a goofy take on the Planet of the Apes basically uh, with uh, with Phil Hartman um, I would check that out that's good but also yeah I'm I'm, I, I try, I, I'm trying to do the sound effect thing I didn't quite get it to work it's it, if I was if I was streaming on on Twitch or, or something or on YouTube, it would work because I it would go directly from my streaming software. But because I'm going through Zoom, there's there's sort of a, an issue. But I'm gonna work on it. We'll see what happens. The thing is, I don't. I was willing to put in a little bit of effort to to do it, and and I have the sound. And like, if I press eight, then or I have to be on OBS. If I press eight and I'm on the slides, then uh, it will in fact. <laughs> Did you, you guys didn't hear anything though? No. no. Okay. So only I heard that it, it was the yeah from the sucks. So I'm working on getting it so that you guys can hear it. Anyway. Um, I didn't, I didn't want to make, I didn't want to change too many things though, because at some point you risk, uh, messing up your actually streaming setup and then you risk, uh, you know, messing up the, the, the ostensible entire purpose of this, which is teaching. So, uh, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, disrupt my, my setup too much because it is somewhat fragile sometimes. So, um, but maybe next week, or, yeah, maybe next week I'll figure it out in, in, a, in a stable way. Uh, okay, so let's um, let's proceed here uh, with with the agenda. Okay, so um, I guess, uh, you know, so so last time we, we basically did the social planner, okay, um, I uh, I looked into the that issue that that we were we were trying to figure out what the growth rates were in that lemon case. It's really pretty unclear, honestly. I think we should just decide to never speak of that equilibrium. As, I mean, it's 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 not an equilibrium. It's uh, that that eventuality. It, it's it gets kind of complicated. I'm I'm gonna try and figure it out this weekend, but it, it's definitely a non-trivial undertaking. Okay, um, and so it's it's not something I think we need to worry about. Um, but it's just one of those things that to, to truly give it the, the, the proper proof of ruling it out actually turns out to be somewhat difficult. Now we, I guess we could, you know, we were, I think Garrett was pointing out last time, you, you could, you could get away with an epsilon condition that I think it's between epsilon one and two, which then it's easy. But then like, once you go beyond two, then it starts getting a little ambiguous. So, um, I'll look into it more, but, but essentially the problem is you get a growth rate there. But then you have to worry about what are um, what what's the net growth. You get a growth rate for for P for per, the level of, of production labor. Then you have to worry about what's the growth rate of output. 
which is potentially going to zero, but potentially not. So, um, and then and then you have to plug that in transversality condition. Um, but even the transversality condition that has you know that has like mu times a inside of it, your asset level, and you have to figure out what what are your assets doing when you're in this sort of unusual path towards you know maximal research. Okay, so. Um, it, 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 there's a lot of things going on, um, but, but I'll try and figure it out this weekend and see what's, what the proper proof looks like. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure, I mean, I, I'm, I'm almost hundred percent sure that it's, it is in fact not a possible outcome, uh, but, um, that, that you don't need additional, uh, parametric constraints to say that this won't happen, that you won't just say like, Hey, let's consume nothing uh and and do all research but but i guess in principle it's not something you can immediately rule out because you know what, what you're this and this is actually this is maybe you can think about this as like the um uh what did we end up doing was that was that in a midterm question i can't remember now where maybe it was a homework question you know where you have a situation where your uh your technology is growing you do a certain amount of uh work with labor um, and like, can you get away with going down to, to, to converging to working zero hours, but then technology keeps getting better that you, you end up with a sort of utopian outcome where no one works, you are working five minutes a day, super efficiently, and it's great. Right now that would be awesome. But, um, you know, it's not always clear that the, you know, the, 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 the math or the, the accounting works out. Right. So this is kind of like that. It's like, okay, well, maybe we could, I guess we're still working, but we're doing research and maybe doing research is more fun. So we're doing research and just generating a huge amount of growth and using almost no labor for productive production uh, on, directly. Um, but then sort of things, you know, the technology advances fast enough that, that it actually can work. Okay. So I, I think that is not, not actually going to happen in this case. Uh, uh, it's just sort of, it's a difficult thing to prove. Okay. Um, Okay, so that's so we so we we will we'll hopefully circle back to that with some some one hundred percent finality next week. Um, but but in the meantime, last time you know we all, we also looked at the social planner. Okay, again, what am I? What, what, what this slide is actually for the equilibrium. So this is this is you know the equilibrium outcome. Okay, where you can see we solved for our star, which is the the search allocation. Okay, which um, uh, you know is. Some I mean, some number between zero and one, okay. And all we really need, okay. And and so, I guess what I should say is it's some number between zero and one, and and the bounds on it are basically that it's less than one for sure. Because if you think about, you know, splitting uh, this into two terms, you get one over epsilon. Epsilon is greater than one, so that's a number less than one. And then subtracting something. Since epsilon is greater than one, this is also positive. That's that's greater than one, so it, it's definitely less than one, regardless of the parameters. Okay, and, and assuming we can rule out that that extreme case, um, and uh, <clears throat> and then the only question is whether it's positive, and so its positivity comes down to a, a condition, you know, that uh, rho, uh, you know, rho times epsilon minus one is less than gamma. Okay, and this is um, so, you know, so so you need to be sufficiently patient, which means rho is low enough. Remember, so rho is your how much you discount so a, a lower row means you're more patient okay um uh and then and then basically your costs uh or so your your productivity rather of research has to be high enough okay so so it's like you know so the you know if, if gamma is really large then you're sort of you're all set okay productivity uh of research is very high uh and you may, you may as well do it okay um then epsilon sort of controls the uh uh, the well, yeah, I mean, it controls the, the level of profits basically. Okay, so that's going to go into how firms think about doing research. So, you know, so gamma and epsilon are going to go, go into how, how they value research, and then Ro is going to talk about, you know, how you know the patient, you know, sort of how patience goes into valuing that stream of profits, right? Because if you're more patient, you're going to value the same stream of profits more. Okay, so, um, yeah, so that's the equal outcome, and then we can. Um, I guess we we just. Okay, so I I I guess I did the um, I added some slides, but we also did the social planner problem, 
Okay, right, and so let me just go up to that, that where it started there with the Hamiltonian, which was on the previous page. Okay, so, you know, it's, with that social planning problem, I mean, really, I just, what I just wanted to show you is, um, uh, one second, is, you know, here we, we sort of started with this Hamiltonian here, right, where n was our state variable, and r was our choice variable, so we're choosing how much research to do at a given time, okay? Um, and the you know, our Hamiltonian is going to be basically u of, of c, so that big thing in there is just c, which is just output, okay? So, so c equals y in this world, okay? Um, so u of c plus mu times n dot, and so that's where you have your, your um, research production function, gamma n r, so n dot equals gamma n r, okay? So, so it's a relatively simple Hamiltonian, um, Okay, and remember we're we're assuming uh, sort of symmetry from the get go because the whole problem is set up to be symmetric, um, and it seems kind of kind of, like a kind of optimization, and so so it should be fine. Uh, so what we know, and by assuming symmetry, we get you know kind of this stuff here that y can be expressed just as that the overall fraction of, of product labor that you split evenly amongst the the product lines and the number of product lines itself. Okay. Um, and that, so then that, that sort of means that we can just choose R. Okay. Um, and then you, you, you go along, you get something that's kind of similar to it or sort of Ramsey style, eliminating mu, doing some substitutions, uh, and you get an answer. Okay. And in particular, you know, at the end of the day, uh, well, okay. I guess I didn't, you know, it, well, I, I, I sort of implicitly wrote R star up there or R hat up there, but the, the answer that you get when you solve for everything looks like this. Okay. Um, and well, let's see. So I'll make sure that that's yeah. Okay. So then, um, and, and you, know, the, you can also write it like, uh, this, let me make sure I'm getting this right. Yeah, um, you can write it like this. So combining the fraction, okay. Um, for gamma, okay. And the reason uh, I'm going to write it like that is because it makes it it makes it easier to compare to what we saw. Sorry, blocking it to compare to what we saw in in equilibrium. Okay, so remember what we saw in equilibrium. I'll just write it over here. Just reading off the the uh, the slides. Okay, it was gamma minus epsilon minus one rho over epsilon gamma. Okay, right. Okay, so that's R star. Okay, um, and the right, and you know, they're they're very similar, except there's that extra gamma term, or sorry, epsilon term uh, on R star. We know that epsilon is greater than one. Okay, and so that means that R star is gonna be less than R hat. Okay, right, so in this case, we get a very unambiguous prediction about R, okay, and and remember G is just you know it, for for whatever case G is just gamma times R, okay. So so by multiplying to get to G, you just kill off that gamma. Same thing applies, of course, right? That 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 they differ by that factor of, of one over epsilon, okay. So um, yeah, okay. So in this case, we we get an unambiguous prediction that there's an inefficient level of of uh, Research or growth, okay, um, in the equilibrium, okay, and essentially, um, I mean, it's, I mean, essentially, you know, whenever uh, basically when someone creates a new product, so it's part of the thing that's going on here is that for a fixed market structure, you'd expect things to be relatively efficient, but when you create a new product, you're actually you're creating new markets, okay, so you're changing the market structure of the economy, um, and so. When you make a new product, uh, you're, you're basically cutting into the profits of existing incumbents. These goods are, remember, are substitutable. Okay, um, and so uh, when you make a new product, you're sort of cutting into the uh, the the um, profits of existing incumbents. Okay, uh, and you're not, and so so the essentially that means that the the existing income the existing incumbents are are sort of being short sighted relative to the social planner. Okay, because they generate a stream of <clears throat> benefits that are that sort of last forever in terms of consumer surplus. Okay, but at some point, um, you know, th there's only so many profits you can hand out. 
right? I mean, you, you have a fixed size of the economy and, and you know, you, you want to give, you know, people need to have wages. Okay, so you have a certain amount of profits that you're sort of handing out. When new products are created, you know, you shift profits from the incumbents into the to the new entrants, okay? But the 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 consumer surplus though, in, in some sense, it's just you, you create some, you create a consumer surplus, a new product, and that sort of lasts forever. The products aren't going away, right? Um, so in some sense, the firms are getting uh, initially sort of compensated, but then that compensation levels off as you switch, as you move those profits to the new the innovators. Okay, so it's sort of a you you want to <clears throat> sort of a double incentivization problem. You want to continue to reward old innovators, but if you only rewarded old innovators, you'd never reward new innovators, and you would have no innovation. Okay, so you need to sort of well, you know, the the the, the equilibrium sort of balances that out in a certain way, but at the end of the day, you can't um, both fully compensate firms for their the, the social sur surplus they create without while at the same time compensating the new entrants okay so um yeah so that's sort of the the logic okay and in this case it gives you an unambiguous answer okay which is that you know that these firms just are not doing the efficient amount of research okay um let's see so yeah okay and so then you can see you know, so so this is true for for when when both are positive, okay. When bo when both of these things are positive, this is true uh, that that r star is less than r hat strictly uh, as long as epsilon is strictly greater than one, okay. Um, and then they're basically both going to hit zero at the same time. If you and what, what I mean by time, I don't mean time in the model. I mean like if you think about varying parameters, okay. So let's say you're increasing rho or you're increasing epsilon. Or, or you know, decreasing gamma, uh, you're gonna, you know, and you're, so you're sort of traversing that space or exploring it. You're gonna hit zero for R at some point, okay? And because of the, not, these numerators are the same, you're gonna hit zero for both at the same time, okay? So then I guess if if you're thinking about, you know, some abstract space, you know, you're so you're moving through row or whatever. It doesn't it doesn't really matter. I mean, you're gonna, um, let me. So, so, so there's going to be some point where you hit zero. Okay. So this is R and this is like whatever your parameter that you're moving around is X. And at some point you're going to hit zero and that's going to be the same, but in, in when, when you're in a positive point, okay, this isn't a great graph, but this, this, you know, so, so R hat's going to be above R star, but then you're going to hit zero at the same time. Okay. So, so, I mean, to be more concrete, this, this could easily be row something that increasing it, uh, will decrease, um, your level of research. Okay, so you increase, you start a low row, um, high research in both, but the the social planner is doing more, and then you hit zero at that same time. Okay, so I guess once once you go into the the world where there's no growth, then there's no inefficiency in in some sense because you just the, the outcome is the same. You don't want to do any growth. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's that's the basic story. Okay, um, uh, and I guess. Um, yeah, so I mean that you know when we'll do some. I guess I'm gonna post a problem set today, tonight. Um, still trying to think about what problem I want to do, but you know a lot of the problems are gonna be variations on this. So maybe uh, you, you can do variations on this. You could you could do a variation of this model where you introduce more um, realistic policies, so you could have um, patents that expire. Okay, so here we implicitly have a perpetual monopoly for for these products. Okay, which would which would be analogous to a, a patent of infinite length. Okay. You could have patents that expire stochastically, okay? Um, and in that case, you know, you'd, you'd have new products. When you, when you create a new product, you're a monopolist for a while, then at some point your patent expires. Anyone can use your technology, okay, uh, to produce, okay? And so essentially you're not gonna make any profits after that, okay? Uh, the, 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 the product is gonna be produced competitively, okay, at marginal cost. Someone's gonna produce it. It doesn't really matter who because they're not going to make any profits. Okay. But it'll get produced somehow. Okay. Um, and then, and then, so, so, so there'll be at any given time, there'll be a certain fraction of products that are protected by, uh, patents. Um, and in, in a steady state, that'll be constant. Okay. You'll have a continual influx of new products, which will be equal to the continual, um, outflux, I guess, of, uh, products that are, you know, expiring, whose patents are expiring. Okay. Um, and so that, so that leading set of products will be protected and then the the the, the older products will, will have a, their patents will be expired and it's produced competitively okay so that, that'll produce some outcome okay and and you know um 
you can see how, how things change uh, uh, in that world. And, and and I mean, maybe, well, actually, you know, in that case, you know, we already have infinite like patents and we still get an, uh, an investment. Okay, so it, it, you, you probably think that actually having patents of finite length would um, be even worse, okay? Um, I, I mean, it would basically be, I mean, you, you, you're going in the opposite direction that you, you would want to be going in terms of increasing incentives. Uh, you do get a little bit of a bonus because when patents expire, their their products that they were covering, those product lines are produced competitively. Okay, so you 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 get you undo you know some kind of monopolistic deadweight loss, uh, so you get a little bit more consumer surplus. Okay, so um, I, I, if I recall correctly, it's not really enough. Okay, it, it's still this that like in this particular model, like you kind of want to have infinite like patents, but even that's not enough. Okay. Um, but you'd have to look at the welfare in that case. You couldn't just look at, um, you couldn't just look at, uh, well, let's see. Well, so yeah, I mean, it, you'd, you'd, you'd want to look at the welfare um, because that, you, instead of just looking at the growth rate, basically, okay, to see how you do. Okay, because it's good, because you're going to have effects from growth and you're going to have a, a static production effects right? From how, how efficiently are you producing? How many monopoly distortions are there in, in the current, you know, at a, at a given time? Okay. So, um, but we'll go, we're going to end up covering stuff related to that um, as we move into the next um, type of model, which is a Schumpeterian model. Okay. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that, sort of um, how to think about, really think about welfare um, in this setting. Okay. Because with the social planner, we're we're, out, we're maximizing welfare. Okay, so we have been thinking about welfare, but but thinking about you can also calculate uh, actual welfare in the equilibrium. Okay, to compare them if you if you wanted. Okay, um, and that can be interesting too. All right. Uh, okay, so then yeah. Um, so yeah. Okay. So but but I'll I'll post that. You know, we'll, we'll we'll talk. We'll have a problem set come up soon. I think we're we're at a point where we've done enough. You know, we've we've basically done the first the, the Romer type model. Okay, so we have a little bit of experience here, and I think we can use that. All right. Um. Okay. So there's one more thing I do want to talk about with the social planner, and then we're going to move on to Schumpeterian stuff. Okay. Uh, so this is over on the slides. Okay. Um. I like how when I'm looking at the at Zoom right now, I have the you know all of your pictures or slash names, but then because my slide looks like it looks a person, like you know it's the social planner has entered the chat. Better watch out. I mean, is is the social planner a student? I feel like the social planner has has supplanted me as the professor. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm 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 powerless in the face of the social planner. What can I, all I can do is solve it and report the answer. So, um. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, all right. So we're, the, this is, this is social planner stuff is, is basically what, what I did last time. It's just when in the slides, I, I decided, well, let me show you the, the full, I don't know, the, the, the unbridled social planner, uh, the gloves come off because, um, last time we, we, you know, we, we assume symmetry and then solved it and that's it. Right. So, and, and because we knew the outcome was going to be symmetric, that, that was fine. Okay. But like the, the 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 full and proper way to do it would be to not assume symmetry, do the full optimization, and then uh, and then show that it actually is a symmetric outcome. Okay, so you get the same answer in the in the end. But but I think it's interesting to, to think about just the the mechanics of how you go through this. Okay, so I'm just going to go through on the slides that way. I don't because because it is actually somewhat cumbersome to write out everything. Uh, so it's much easier to do it in the slides. Okay, so so what's the full statement of the social planner? Well, um, you know we have a bunch of labor out there. Okay, we can use it for research, we can use it for production. And then within production, uh, we can use it on any given of, uh, number of the, the product lines there that are out there uh, of the end product lines. Okay, so that's what this this is our, you know, in, in that to, in the sense of thinking about that as an allocation, this is the constraint on our allocation. Okay. Um, and so before this was just P here, this integral was just P and we, we you know, so then it became a one variable optimization. You know, either choose P or R and, and infer the other as one minus the other. Um, whereas here, I mean, you, you have, I mean, the, you can eliminate R 
by saying that r is 1 minus the integral of all these l's. But you basically have to choose all the l's, OK? Um, and and we, you know, we can do that. I mean, te technically, uh, this is not covered by uh, the theorem that we should, the Hamiltonian theorem we had, because that was just, um, was that, that, was, that was probably even one variable. Here we have a continuum of variables that we're optimizing over. But what's the difference really between one and a literal infinity of infinities? So um, it, it still basically works, okay? And so, uh, yeah, so so that's one thing, okay? And then the other thing, which which I didn't really mention last time, but it, which is really just an interpretational kind of thing, but how to think about R, okay? What, you know, what is R? So so here, I just, you know, it's just R. It's, it's, a, it's a massive research and it's just happening all at once, okay? And, and, um, you know, you, you take capital R, you multiply it by gamma and N, and that gives you N dot. That's your research production function. Okay, so it, it was it was specified in the aggregate, basically. Okay, um, and, and, so, and the way we thought about it was like, it was just like one firm or entity or something making that decision, but but in, um, in, a, in, a, in a sense that they were maximizing private benefits, right? They, they, they weren't a government or a social planner. Okay, so um okay so now there's there's a slightly different way you can think about it okay and so let me just jump into the slides real quick to talk about this which you know so so before we said okay this was our research production function um okay and then r just sort of like was the thing and uh you know the the free entry condition you know we thought about the benefit was n dot times v okay number of new products times their per product value should be equal to w which is basically your cost or your opportunity cost Okay, so um, uh, sorry, times R, right? So W, you, you pay each worker W, and there's there's our workers. Okay, so so this was specified kind of in the aggregate. Okay, um, but but really it's 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 equivalent to you know if you plug in, okay, then you get gamma n R equals W R, which means if you cancel the R's, gamma n that's equal. Keep forgetting V. Can't forget about V. That's kind of important. Um, v is equal to W. Okay, so so if you plug in for n dot, you can basically cancel those R's, and you get this, which is really what we were looking at. So so this is like the marginal, right? So th this one here is in the aggregate, which in some sense doesn't make sense. You know, usually you don't say, okay, well your, your total profits should be zero. Okay, I mean. It, Maybe you could say, well, if they were, you know, if they were positive, then you'd have entry and, and vice versa. Uh, but but when you think about marginally, it's like, okay, if I increase my research a little bit, then the the marginal benefit and marginal costs are equated. That means I'm at some kind of optimum. Okay, so so this this would be the marginal statement. Either way you think about it, we end up at this equation at the end. Okay, um, and uh, and that gives us, you know, that lets us solve the model. Okay, um, but 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 really, you know, um, because everything is linear here. So this production function, in particular, this production function up top for for ideas is linear in R. Okay, so instead of thinking about it as, as a monolithic research entity, we could think about it as as any arrangement of of. We could think about it as just individual researchers, of which there are many. Okay, and if you're an individual researcher, okay, then you, you, you're saying, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of research. And if I do a little bit of research, I'm sort of, my probability of success is gamma times N. Okay. I'm going to do like one unit of research. As one researcher, I do one unit of research. My probability of success is gamma N. If I succeed, I get some value V. Um, and I could have been a production worker and gotten wage W. That's my opportunity cost. Okay. So you get the same thing if you just think about it from the perspective of an individual. Okay. And that's possible essentially because of because the the aggregate one that we specified is linear in R. Okay, so you could essentially because it's a linear, it doesn't matter how you arrange everyone. You could have everyone works for Bell Labs back in the day or AT and T, and you just do a bunch of research and that's it. Um, or it could be everyone works at a startup that are really small, uh, you know, uh, yeah, and and they're just they're just uh, you know, sort of small operation and they're more distributed. Okay. Same, it would be the same thing because of the linearity. You just add up how many how many researchers are there, okay? Uh, or it could be every, you know, it could literally be just like individual people in their garage doing their thing, um, and you just add it up. So the the production function 
because it's linear is saying that adding up what you know the, how you arrange people doesn't matter okay and that's an assumption okay because we know that it's different to have people in their garage it's different to have people clustered into small companies it's different to have everyone clustered into a large corporate lab their interactions basically that make it nonlinear. okay now how exactly those play out is is really an empirical matter okay but but we know actually there are interactions okay so this is an assumption and it's not necessarily a hundred percent accurate assumption okay but it you know it makes our lives easier okay so so we're we're, we're the assumption we're making is is sort of like we're op, we're operating in a world where either there aren't big interactions there aren't big gains from doing like large corporate labs or um for whatever reason people are just scattered out doing their own thing okay very highly distributed okay so so but that but it's all really about the linearity okay and um you know, and so you remember the Jones taxonomy, right? You know, we, we, we had that eta in the general setting, you know, we had like an eta on here. Okay. So here we're saying eta equals one, but the, the alternative is, is you have something that's not one. Okay. And, and that, well, actually that, that kind of makes things complicated, but you know, um, because then you need to think about how the research process happens and how people are arranged. Okay. Um, so we're not going to go there. Okay. We're not going to go there this time this class okay because it's, it actually does get really complicated um but but it's it's a thing to be aware of okay that the the arrangement of research is also important we're just creating as a bulk quantity right for this for our purposes okay all right so um back to the slides okay so that's our that's a sort of side quest on our we're, we're just going to call it our and and treat it as as this this bulk quantity um uh, because because the linearity makes that a safe thing to do Okay. Um, all right. So now let's forge ahead. Okay. How do we do the, the general optimization? Okay. So this, uh, well, it gets, it gets kind of complicated and you can't just, uh, so, so your op, your, your state variable is still N. Okay. I keep looking up cause the, this, this, could, this is the time of year where these monstrous bees flying around. I don't know if you guys are experiencing this, but it's kind of alarming. Like, what is that thing? Okay, so, but they don't sting you. It's just like they're they're monstrous, you know. They're, they're kind of scary looking. Um, okay. Anyway, I'll try and I'll try and stay focused here. So, uh, you know, your, your state variable is still n. It's just the number of products you have. Okay. Um, and there's no the products don't have any features, right? So that so, it, I mean, you, you could say your state variable is the set of products that you have. That it's not a variable at all. That it's but then you can't take a derivative. I don't know. It, you know, so, so I, yeah, let's just say it's, N. it's, it's the number of products. They're totally featureless. And so it's just, how many do you have? Okay. Uh, but the choice variable we're saying now is, is a very much higher dimensional object. It's not just how, how much production are you putting in total, but it's how much production are you putting in for each and every of this continuum of products from zero to N. Okay. Uh, so that's why I'm writing, you know, on the, uh, on the first term for the Hamiltonian. Okay. You have, so it's U of C which is equal to y, okay? So that's that whole thing in there is that aggregator, right? But remember that yi, the production of, for the individual product lines is just equal to li. We have like unit productivity in terms of labor, okay? So I just plugged in li for yi, right? So that's, this maps from all the li's into total output. Accounting for the fact that y equals li and accounting for this um, epsilon sort of CES style aggregator, okay? And then we wrap that utility function. Boom, that's a flow, flow uh, utility. Okay. Um, then how do things evolve? How does n evolve? Well, it's, it, it's the same thing basically as before, mu times n dot, which is gamma times n r. In this case, because we're choosing all those l's, r is just the residual left over. So it's one minus the integral of all those li's from zero to n. Okay. So that's the full specification of our Hamiltonian. It's pretty gnarly looking, uh, but but actually we can, we can basically deal with it. Um, Okay, so then, so for, you know, let's go one step at a time. We're going to first order condition for for each li. We should be optimizing over all of those. And it's the same thing we had when we were thinking about the problem of the final good aggregator firm that for an individual li, actually the, the derivative is just zero because it's infinitesimal. But but you should sort, you should really be optimizing for all of them in some sense. Okay, so um, so so that's how we're going to do it. So, so uh you know, the second line here on the slide, basically the H sub LI, the derivative with respect to LI. Uh, so you're going to get a U prime of everything that's inside, which is just, I'm going to call C. Okay. So now I'm writing C instead of that giant integral with the epsilons and everything. Okay. 
but then you pick up a chain rule, okay? And, and that chain rule is going to look like, um, well, it's, it's the derivative of y with respect to, to li or yi equivalently. So it's going to look like that demand function that we, we got a while ago before, because that also was just the derivative, the marginal product. Uh, so that's what you pick up. You pick up this ratio raised to the one over epsilon. Okay. Uh, you know, so, so you, you, you know, remember when we took the derivative of y with respect to yi, it's the same thing. You, you, you decrement the power, you pick up a chain from, from what's inside, but when you decrement the power, it's really just y to the one over epsilon. Okay. So there, there's a little bit of algebra buried in there, but, but this is what you get. Okay. Uh, and then subtracting, well, you know, if you, if you do a little bit more LI research, you, you, you're doing a little bit less, um, sorry, if you do a little bit more LI production, you're doing a little bit less research. So you get you know, minus uh, mu gamma n at one, basically. Okay. All right. So that's what you get there. Okay. Um, now. Right. Okay. So the, here, here's the, log, the the logical flow. Okay. So it, going to the last line is it's actually a good bit of algebra, um, but at, just looking at the second line, you have a zero equals a bunch of stuff, and then li is in there. Okay. You could solve for li. Li is mu gamma n over mu prime of c raised to the epsilon inverted times y or whatever. You know. So you, you can solve for li, and get a thing, and that's not a function of i at all. Li equals something is not a function of i at all. The li's are already constant; they're already invariant across i. This is this is where we've shown that that symmetric outcome that that you're going to choose the same thing for all your li's. Okay. Um, well, I guess okay. Really, I should I should also show concavity. Okay, I should show concavity of this objective. But if you take a derivative of this um, derivative with respect to li, you're going to get. Um, it, it's decreasing in li, right? See, if this term here, it, it, so so you, in general, you, you want to check uh, second order conditions, although almost always I don't, right? Uh, so you take the second derivative here. I mean, this term drops out. This this is decreasing in li, right? So it's 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 it, it satisfies the concavity conditions pretty well. Okay, so so it's concave. Therefore, it's a convex optimization. You can solve for li as something that doesn't depend on i. The allies are the same across i. Okay, so so we get that, right? And once you have that, then you can say that. Um, uh, let's see. You can say that uh, you can basically go to that aggregate specification. You can say, well, well, then li is p some for some p over n. Okay, and then you can say that y is p times n to the one over epsilon minus one. That's what we solved. Once once you make that symmetry assumption about about li being p over n you plug that back into your final bit aggregator and you get y is p times n to the one over epsilon minus one okay and you plug that in okay and it shows that the p's cancel okay so when, once you get that symmetry assumption then you you can sort of invoke all of that other stuff so you've already taken the derivative okay so you've done it in the proper order you, you took the derivative showed symmetry and then you can start simplifying and when you do that you you return to this, which is which is what we got when we when we just made the symmetry assumption right off the bat. Okay, so you plug in it's basically li here. This li is going to be p over n. This is going to be p times n to the one over epsilon minus one. P's cancel. The n's simplify ultimately to this. Okay, so there's a couple different steps of algebra, but but essentially you're going to get something like this. Okay, and again I'm not going to combine these because they're going to cancel cleanly later on. Okay, I'm not going to combine these ends here. Okay, so. So this is what you get finally um, when you do it sort of in the proper order, okay? And, and you get the same thing as what you would have gotten, as what we got before, okay? All right, so keep that, keep that around. We're going to use that in a second, okay? But now we need to do the the other condition, the co-state evolution or whatever, um, okay? And so here, uh, what do we do? We do. Rho, rho is our discount rate, no population growth. Rho mu minus mu dot is equal to Hn. Okay. But then what is Hn? If if we have this set here, well, if we, if we think about what is Hn, what's the derivative here, we, we basically just have Leibniz rules. Right? Remember Leibniz rule when you're taking uh, 
the derivative with respect to the balance of the integral, you just evaluate the integrand, I think it's called, at the bound. Because think about it, if, if you're if you're increasing the scope of an integral, the, 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 the marginal effect is just the, the slice. Or you're adding on slices in a Riemannian you know, sense. And so that derivative is just going to be the size of that slice that you're adding on to the end of the, uh, of the integral. Okay, so here we're going to have your in, you're increasing n, h sub n, that's the derivative. So you're just going to get that the, 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 the value of the slices here and here. Okay, and then we can work with that. In short, Leibniz rules. Okay, so um, hn, okay, so you're going to get... Uh, a u prime of c, okay, I'm going to jump back one slide to show you. You're going to get a u prime of c and then the derivative of what's in here, which is where Leibniz rule showed up. So you're going to get L sub n to the epsilon minus 1 over epsilon raised to, or, or sorry, you're going to get this outer derivative. And then finally, once you get toward, you're going to get the u prime, you're going to get the outer derivative, and then you're going to get the Leibniz rule. Okay, so it's actually sort of an arduous process. Here, it, it's more linear, so you'll get these terms and then just like an L sub n, right? The derivative of this thing here with respect to n is just L sub n. So you evaluate i at n, that last product that you add, what happens to it, okay? But it turns out that L sub n is gonna look like all the other L sub i's because we've already shown symmetry. So it's not some exotic object. It's, it's just, it's the same as an L i, it just happens to be the most recent one, okay? So that's that's what we're gonna get. So basically, you, know, you get u prime, you get that outer derivative, which gives you epsilon over epsilon minus one, y to the one over epsilon, and then you get the inner value, the integrand evaluated at n, at i equals n, okay? And then same thing, mu gamma n, the integrand evaluated at n, that one's just a linear integral, so you get L sub n, okay? Um, all right, okay, so, so that's the first step. Just be careful about how you apply it, really gets the rule. And then, but then after that, well, you, we know that ln is equal to like li, the generic li, which is equal to p over n, Okay, so you can plug all that in. This is gonna be this is gonna be p over n. This is why we already know it's p times n to the one over epsilon minus one. Okay, so so I, I kind of did it. Yeah, I so you can I, I kind of simplified it, but this is what you get once you once you kind of simplify it a little bit. Okay, and then here L, L sub n is p over n times n, so you just you're just left with p. Okay. All right, so this is Leibniz's rule. We partially simplify using symmetry, which we showed from the first order condition on the last slide. We get this, which isn't pretty, but we can plug in the first order condition to, to basically simplify this substantially. Because the first order condition, we had like this mu u prime of c, we had an n floating around. Uh, what was it? Yeah, basically this u prime of c, n to the water epsilon minus one is mu gamma. So, so this u prime of c and this guy here turn into a mu mu gamma p. Okay. Uh, so do that, plug that in, and actually it fully it totally simplifies. A bunch of you know you plug it in and these end up looking very similar, such that you can combine everything into one term. Okay. So there's like three you know there's like three different steps of algebra in here, but once you plug in for the first order condition, you end up here, and this is what we got when we did the original optimization where we, we pre-assumed symmetry. Okay, this this type of thing. Or once we also subbed in for the first order condition. Okay, so, so we end up back at something relatively simple. And then from there, it's just eliminating mu, mu, and and and, uh, and, and so on. So you, you, you solve for the growth rate of mu, you take the growth rate of the, the first order condition, like we did before. So the steps after this are the same same basic things that we did in the original optimization. You, you take the growth rate of the first order condition and get another condition featuring the growth rate of mu. Combine those two to, so as to eliminate the growth rate of mu and hence mu itself. And you get some you know, diffy Q for, in this case, P. Okay, um, which is which you can convert into a diffy Q for R because P is, or R is one minus P. And so, you know, I, you know, a couple different lines of algebra and you get that same sort of quadratic form looking type of thing and they downward facing quadratic form with, uh, you know, zero points at one and at that R hat. So you get, you get the same exact answer. 
that you 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 eliminate mu, you get this diffy q for p, convert it into one for r, and it's quadratic around one and r hat, that r hat is the same that we derived before. Okay, and that's um Yeah, so 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 after that point, it's 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 all what we did last time. Okay, and so you, you remember, let me uh, the prepare. So you know the you can you can uh, plot that quadratic form. Okay, and see the these zeros at one in our hat, and then this is going to be unstable. So you have to start at our hat. Okay, so this is you get the same answer for the social planner. Okay, the only thing we did differently here was not assuming symmetry and doing it sort of the hard way showing symmetry, which allows us to simplify. And then we, we end up back on the same sort of path to, to this differential equation, which then implies a, a, a unique outcome. Okay. Um, all right. So, so, so yeah, after, and after that, it's the same as what we did last time in class. Um, now the, 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 you know, the steps going through that, I mean, they, they can be tricky. Okay, uh, you know, things are canceling and it's important that they cancel in the right way. Otherwise, you're going to get lost. Okay, but um, but it's, it's essentially the same steps. Okay. All right. I would go over that you know, on your own just to make sure you understand each, each individual step. Okay, but, but, but really some of it's just, it's just kind of heavy algebra. Okay, so I don't, I don't want to spend too much time um, in lecture because I'll probably screw it up anyway. So, yeah. Um, uh, but, but yeah, so, so, so go through that and, and make sure you understand the, the process. Okay. Um, all right. So, so that's, that's kind of it. I mean, just in terms of the, the, the basic treatment of the Romer model. Okay. Um, or what, you know, so I'll call it Romer. Sometimes you could call it expanding varieties. Okay. Cause that's, you know, that's really a more descriptive term, I guess, of what's going on. Okay. Um, that's, that's, that's model variant number one. The variants gotta watch out for those variants. Um, model variant number two. These are more friendly variants, though. They're not gonna harm you in any way. I mean, they're gonna make you do a bunch of annoying algebra, but but that's gonna be the worst of it. Okay. Um, the the other model variant is the Schupiterian model. Okay. So let me pop back to the slides. Okay. All right. So boom. Schupiterian growth has entered the chat. Uh, so Schupiterian growth is a little different from Romer style. Romer style was expanding varieties, still is. And uh, this is, we're going to have a fixed number of varieties, but people are going to be kind of battling it out over who gets to produce them. Okay. So, um, and and that's, well, it's going to be a, comp I mean, it's, it's, it's a complicated process. Okay. But I mean, essentially, you know, the, the dynamic is going to be, you have a, we're going to have a unit massive product line, zero to one instead of zero to N. Okay. At any given time, this is going to be an outcome that we're going to show this outcome occurs, but at any given time, uh, a, a one firm is going to be monopolistically producing a product line, a given product line. So for each product line, there's going to be one firm producing that. Not that one firm is producing all of them. There's, there's a continuum of different firms producing a continuum of different product lines, but there's only one producing a given line at a given time. And then firms are going to be doing research and they're going to improve the production technology in a given product line. They're going to go and kick out the incumbent and it's going to happen that way. It's going to happen that I have a better technology. You're just done incumbent. So it's not like, oh, I get 50% of the market share. You get 50%. We're going to cook it up. So it's just like, boom, you're out. Okay. That just makes things simpler. You don't have to worry about having multi uh, firm markets and things like that. Okay. So um, it, it's really just a simplification thing to make our lives a little easier. Uh, as researchers. Um, so um, that's going to be a dynamic. You do the research, you kick out the incumbent, you're the new incumbent. You're around until someone else comes along and kicks you out. Okay. You no. Know, so it's like Highlander. You're born by the sword, you die by the sword, right? So you're born by innovation, you die by innovation. And that process, that churn is creative destruction. That's what Schip so Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter, uh, you know, he, he was actually, he, I looked it up. He didn't coin the phrase creative destruction, but he popularized it. So I don't even know. I, I read the name of the person who coined it and I've forgotten their name already. Unfortunately, I should probably give them more recognition, but if you go on Wikipedia, that person is there. Okay. Uh, but Jupiter somehow, I don't know. 
he popularized it. Um, okay, and so, but the basic idea is, you know, you're you're creating creating new technology. Okay, better technology. The destruction is is that you're you're displacing um, an existing incumbent. Okay, uh, that's bad for them. Okay, it, it's uh, in in this model. This dynamic won't show up, but but you know, in a real world setting, it's it's bad for the workers. You know, you're 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 working at a firm, that firm goes out of business, you don't immediately find a new job, you need to look for one. Maybe you uh you you your skills are very firm specific, you know, uh you have trouble finding a job, you're maybe in an industry that's declining, so on so so there's a lot of potential disruption negative in a bad sense that um uh comes from this, right? So so there is this trade-off, right? You, you want to create new things, but the the amount of you know you want to sort of minimize the disruption in a sense, okay? Um, and so, so 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 policy is sort of navigating that that dynamic, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, but that's that's the basic idea. That's how things are going to work, okay? And our our what we're going to do is what well, I'm going to show you, okay? Well, well, how can we set it up? What's the market structure, and and then why is it going to be that? When a, a new firm comes in that they just immediately kick the old one out what what assumptions drive that okay and, and why do we want to have that okay so i'll give you an understanding of why why am i showing this particular model the the purpose of the model is to exemplify this dynamic of creative destruction because it gives you sort of interesting efficiency properties okay um it, it gives you interesting efficiency properties in the sense that you don't necessarily always get an underinvestment. you can kind of get either one so you're going to get inefficiencies but you can't necessarily say which way they're going to go Okay, it's a bit more nuanced. Okay, uh, it's uh, you still have that same sort of time horizon thing, right? So if you're getting kicked out very soon after you come up with this new product, you know, your new product still produces social surplus that lasts forever because future innovators build on top of what you did. Okay, so your social surplus in this world still lasts forever, but you may get kicked out very quickly, in which case you're not going to internalize much of your your uh, the benefit that you generated as a, a researcher. Right, uh, so there's definitely a, a time horizon effect where, where firms may act too short-sightedly because they are being kicked out relatively quickly. Okay, um, but at the same time, because we have this sort of this dynamic where the the innovator just comes in and kicks out the incumbent, you could also imagine doing too much research or too much innovation because maybe I I improve this product by like just the smallest fraction. I just add another razor blade to this already five bladed razor. Uh, and I come in and um, this isn't a great example because Gillette is kind of monopolist, but you know, I, I come in with a, an incremental improvement um, in this in this product and kick out the, the incumbent. All right. I didn't really add that much, but I my reward was the entire product market. OK, so you, it kind of seems like I'm being over rewarded. And, and in some sense, I am. Okay, so you can also, and, and if I'm over rewarded, then that's actually going to be, it's going to produce too much innovation, too much churn uh, in that, that product market. Okay, so so you, you could you could give intuition for going either way and 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 what intuition is the right one. I mean, they're both kind of right in some, some sense, but what the, the sort of the net outcome is depends on, on the parameters. Okay, so, it, but it's not going to be a clear prediction either way. All right. Okay, so, um yeah i think well, this this is more or less what i was saying but uh let's see if there's anything here yeah so yeah okay I, i'll add some stuff here so the um with with romer okay you you sort of were softly competing with your 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 predecessors as a new innovator because when you uh basically when when you come in you're cutting into the profits a little bit but it's you're sort of you're cutting into everyone's profits by a very small fraction that came before you okay whereas in the creative destruction world the Schubertarian model you're cutting into a very specific single firm's profits a hundred percent okay so it's a slightly different dynamic there and how the the competition is more head to head okay um all right and and then like i said we're going to have a fixed set of product lines and people are just going to be competing over who produces those okay um now you can think about uh in terms of the interpretation you can think about this zero to one index as product lines, just like we did in Rummer. Okay. But you could also kind of expand it to think about something more general, like a need. Okay. So you can think about, um, uh, you know, so, so as technology advances, oftentimes you, 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 uh, satisfy the same need, but with like a different or better technology. Okay. So you used to have 
a calendar that you was physical paper that you would write on, or maybe you still do, um, but but you know, most people don't. Uh, you, you write on it, you write your schedule and so on. Uh, but then you get, you know, smartphones are invented or, or, you know, at least internet calendars and things like that. Um, okay, so it's not the same product, right? It's not a physical calendar anymore. It's a, it's, a, it's a smartphone, but it does the same thing. The need is to keep track of your time and schedule things. Okay, so you can, you can generalize the notion of a product line to like a need. And so when I come in with this new innovation, um, I just do that same, I satisfy the same need, but uh, better somehow with higher quality or just more cheaply. Okay, so so um, the way I'm going to talk about it now is mostly just going to be you do it more cheaply. Okay, but you can kind of also there's a slightly different variant to the model where you have a, a notion of product quality, um, which well it actually looks pretty similar, but 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 I think the interpretation is different. But for now, just think about it as you come in, you 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 either produce that same product or you satisfy the same need, same need but but for lower cost using less labor. Okay. All right, so. That's okay. So that's already the interpretation. Okay. Uh, now how does, how does that work? What's the process? Well, um, okay. So we're going to have to have changes in productivity. Okay. So the, the, the change in the state now isn't the number of products. It's, it's how efficiently you're producing the, the, the fixed set of products. Okay. Um, and so we need another way for that to sort of come in. And, and the way we're going to do it is to change that that per product production function, okay? So you're gonna have, and it's before we would have yi equals li, okay? Now we're gonna have yi equals qi li. So qi is like your uh, labor productivity for that particular product, and that's specific to a, a technology, okay? So it's it I I'm, I'm not, I don't I just have i. You can think about it as qi f, where f is like the firm, okay? So you know, you know, one firm is is really good at producing this product cheaply. One firm is so good, you know. So, so uh, maybe I should have F. But in general, what I'm going to write is for the the state of the art technology for the, the best firm will be QI, and then sort of the second best firm I'll write is Q minus I, Q minus I. So like game theory style uh, minus I, so that the 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 nearest competitor to that firm. Okay, but there's not going to be any Nash equilibria. Don't worry. Uh, well, there I means maybe, but it, it's not going to be complicated. Okay, it's really not going to be game theory style complicated. All right. Um, Okay, so so that's you know that production function is just, you have this new productivity parameter QI, which controls how how productive your, this te this uh, technology is. Okay, so uh, and then when innovation happens, you you increase QI. Okay, so innovation, your people are investing in innovation, they're gonna they'll randomly they'll succeed on a particular product line, boom, you're gonna increment that uh, QI by some factor lambda. Okay, so for a uh, uh, Fixed for if you're just looking at one product line, over time it's gonna look like it's gonna stay still for a while, and then it's gonna kachunk up. It's gonna stay still for a while, then it's gonna kachunk up again randomly. Okay, and this is gonna be, it's gonna well, it's it's actually gonna look like what's called a Poisson process. Okay, um, I'll get into that in a minute, but it, it's it's gonna be just this random time between innovations. Okay, that time, the distribution of that time is gonna be determined by how. Um, much people are investing in research, how, how intensely they're doing research. Okay. Um, so, but for a given product line, it's going to be this sort of periodic process, but also a random period. Okay. Uh, but then when you look at it in the aggregate, because you're integrating over a continuum of product lines, it's going to look sort of smooth and continuous still, right? Because you're taking all these different independent processes and averaging them. And so, so the, the average number of innovations just going to produce this, this, this smooth growth path. Okay, so so we're not going to have aggregate fluctuations or randomness or anything like that because we're integrating it all out. Okay, um, but for an individual firm, you know, you're going along making profits, and then boom, you're done. That's it. No one comes in. You're out. Nothing. Nothing to say for it. Okay, so, um, and then the yeah, and then the assumption here uh, uh, is that the labor markets are sort of hyper efficient. The workers lose their jobs at those firms, but then they immediately find them at other firms. And everything's fine. Okay, that's a simplification, but that's that's the background assumption. Is the, the the cost disruptions are minimal. Okay. That's a yeah. That's yeah. It's a jump. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So uh, and then yeah, and so so you you could also write like um. Qi equals lambda times q minus i. To, to give the dependence between there's 
QI is the state of the art, but it's, it, we're going to need to remember kind of what's, what's the previous. Yeah. They just have, yeah, that line, that, yeah, exactly. So, so the, the old firm is the old firm they're, they're done for sure. But, um, how close they are to you is going to be important because, you know, if you think about it, if I come in, we'll see this in a second, but if I, if I come in with a, a really big step size, I'm, I'm, it's going to be like, I have not, not much of competition and I'm going to get a fairly high level of profits. If I come in with this, this really incremental innovation, the, they're still a competitor, basically a fairly close competitor. So the, the amount of profits I get, it's going to be minimal. Okay. So that basically your profits are going to be um, an increasing function of your step size in this world. But because of that, yeah, it, yeah. So it's the jump to, to the new one. Exactly. So yeah. So just, yeah. So the, 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 the Lambda is going to basically fully determine your profit level. Okay. Now the good thing is that it's the lambda that determines your profit level, not like Q minus I or anything like that, because then you'd have this really complicated dependence on history. Here, we, we're, we're cutting off history dependence by by making, well, particular assumptions as, as we'll see, okay? So, um, okay, so that's that's actually, basically we're, we're gonna go down to explain that uh, now, okay? But first, um, just wanna talk about what's the aggregator that we're using, okay? So, um, Okay, so in general, we can use any aggregator we want, okay? We can use the exact same aggregator that we used before with the epsilons, if we wanted, okay? Um, it turns out, well, so so just like I was saying a second ago, it, it, if you have a general aggregator, you, you, do, you get this issue where um, the lambda might, lambda is going to be important, okay? in determining your profit level, but also the overall level of Q and how it relates to all the other firms is still kind of going to be important because it's like, think about you, you've got the, 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 the new innovator state of the art, you know, Lambda step QI, you've got the old innovator and that product line Q minus I, which is just a Lambda step below QI. Um, you've got all these other product lines, which are still substitutable, you know, when for a general upside, they're still substitutable. So it's like, there's many, there's different outcomes. It's like, I, maybe I'll just price so as to keep out a uh, Q minus I uh, firm. Maybe I'll have to price to keep people from jumping ship to an entirely different product lines. So it gets actually kind of complicated. Um, it's doable for sure. Um, it's just more complicated than we need. Um, to get around that, <clears throat> if you if you go to the limit where epsilon equals one, which has previously been basically sort of inaccessible for us, um, <clears throat> because, uh, you end up in like a hyper monopoly situation. Uh, well, we can go there now because we have Q minus I keeping us honest, right? Before when you went to epsilon equals one, like the, the level of substitution was so low, you become a, a very, um, exploitive monopolist. Basically and you'd set an infinitely high price. Now you still have in your own product line that prior incumbent constraining how much of a monopolist you can be. Okay. So when you set up some the one you kill, you basically kill off cross comp product competition, functionally speaking. Uh, but because you still have within product competition, keeping things bounded, it doesn't go off the rails like it did before. Okay. That's the basic idea. And when you do that, you get this neat result that your profit level basically is only going to depend on Lambda how much better you are than that, that prior incumbent. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the logic. Okay. And so it, it's not like we have to do this. It's just like, it makes our lives easier. And if this, you know, this is the first Schumpeterian model we're looking at, we want to try and do this as simple as we can and then build off from there. Okay. Um, okay. So there's one, there's one. Okay. So then now there's sort of like a, a, a chain of events <clears throat> that motivates some of our other assumptions. Okay. So for instance, why did we have to choose a unit mass of products? Okay, well, well, for one, I mean, if we have a fixed amount of products, you may as well, okay? Just if, if something is fixed over time, oftentimes it's it's <clears throat> benign to just say that it's one. Uh, but in this case, actually, if you think about, okay, so what does that epsilon one limit look like? Okay, so it's kind of like CES Cobb Douglas. It's, it's basically exactly like that. Um, <clears throat> hold on. 
kind of like CES Cobb Douglas. Okay. When you, when you start CES in zero sense and then take the limit as sigma goes to one, <clears throat> you end up at Cobb Douglas, Cobb Douglas, uh, uh, law, you know, and Cobb Douglas means that the log of Y is a linearly weighted sum of the log of, you know, K and L or, or whatever your inputs are, right? So that, that when you know, Y equals K to the alpha L one minus alpha, take logs, it just means it's linear in the logs. That's what characterizes Cobb Douglas. Okay. Same thing is true here, but instead of two inputs, we have a continuum of inputs. All right. So before we were, we were sort of epsilon CES aggregating those, you know, YIs all together. When we take the limit as epsilon goes to one, okay, uh, then we're going to end up in a, a linear in the logs world. Okay. So here I've written it as y is e, you know, exponent integral of log. Take the log of that equation. <clears throat> You get log of y is a linear integral of the log of the of the yi's, right? So it's the same thing, just with the continuum instead of two inputs, you, you end up linear in the logs as you go to epsilon equals one. Okay. Now there's one thing that arises with though, which is which is kind of weird. Okay, in the original production function, that was always kind of returns to scale, right? Regardless of what epsilon was, it was always kind of returns to scale. But if you look at this thing. And, think, and, and work through the algebra, what happens when you multiply all the yi's by xi? It turns out it's only constant returns to scale when n equals one. Okay, so there's this weird, you know, the, the limit, the function at the limit is not equal to the limit of the function kind of thing, because it's not, it, it's, it's, we're talking about a property, which is a complex property. We're not talking about a function here, but, but it's a property. The property doesn't hold at the limit, but it holds in the path up to the limit for some reason. Okay, so, but if you think about, okay, if you think about multiplying each of these yi's by xi, so you got a little xi shows up in here, you can factor it out. Well, first you can factor it out here as a, a plus log of x, so log of x plus log of y, okay? Um, and then factor it out again through the integral, you're going to get an n. So you're going to get n times the log of x. Then fat, well, well, then n times the log of x is the log of x to the n. Factor it out again, and you cancel the log. Okay, so you're going to get an x to the n up front when you do that. Okay, and here, when I write y little arrow, that's a, a, a an infinite dimensional vector. It's maybe, I don't know if it's a Hilbert space element, but it's the, 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 it's the whole set of yi's. Okay, so you, you multiply the whole set of yi's by xi, map it through this aggregation function, you're gonna get the original one times x to the n. Okay, now this is only, you know, so, so CRS says that uh, this, so CRS basically only holds when n equals one. When n equals one, it really is the case that uh, multiplying each input by x multiplies the final output by x. If n is greater than one, it's, it's, it's exemplifying increasing returns. If n is less than one, it's exemplifying decreasing returns. At exactly n equals one, it satisfies constant returns. Okay, so it's just one of those things. Um, it's, it's uh, I don't have a good intuition, actually. I've, I've, I've been trying to think of intuition for like years. I don't, I don't know. It, it's, it's mysterious to me, but, um, but it's fine. It, it's not a huge, it doesn't make our lives any harder. In fact, it, make, it makes our lives easier. Uh, we don't have to carry around a number that, that N is, it's just one, okay? All right, so let's do that. Um, okay, so we got five minutes. Okay, so so uh, I wanna try and, well, I wanna give you some intuition for what's the outcome of this product market. So, so we, we were going along happily at QI, the old incumbent QI, um, and then someone comes along and, and disrupts the product market. They innovate, okay? And they increment QI to Lambda QI. Okay, so now they're, well, in some sense, they're QI now. They're the best. And we are uh, Q minus I, which I guess I wrote here, Q minus I, which is QI over Lambda. Okay, so, so they've become the state of the art. We're now, we're now old news, where Q minus I equals QI over Lambda, okay? So the question is, How's this all going to play out? Okay, what's going to happen? Well, um, it turns out that uh, okay, so so the <clears throat> the uh, leader they have a couple options. One option, which is actually what's going to happen, is is what's called limit pricing. They can price it so that we for sure are not going to make any money and would not want to enter. Okay, because 
think of think about the marginal cost situation. Okay, so these are labor productivities. Okay, QIs are labor productivities. So um, let me, I think it's easier if I write this out. Uh, the QIs are labor productivity. So, so, um, so it's limit pricing. Okay, so um, YI is QI times LI. Okay. Um, so then you're to, to produce YI, you need to use LI units of uh, labor to do this, to do so, just in rate of that function. And that means your cost, okay, uh, is WLI, which is WYI over QI, right? And that means that your marginal cost, or I guess I for, for product line I, marginal cost is just, is that, that coefficient on YI, which is WI over QI. Okay, so W, the wage obviously is gonna be important for your marginal cost that's we're producing with labor. Uh, and then as QI goes up, your productivity goes up, your marginal cost actually goes down, right? So the, the, net, the net outcome is that your marginal cost is w i w over q i okay now that's for the leader okay now for the follower uh for the the old incumbent which i'll say is their marginal cost mc minus i well it's going to be w over q minus i okay and so that's w q minus i is q i over lambda Right, it's the state of the art divided by what was the the, the step size, um, okay? Which is when you move the lambda to the top, it's, it's lambda over QI uh, times W, I guess. Maybe it doesn't matter, but you know, lambda W over QI. All right, so so you that's their marginal cost, okay? So what what can the leader do? Okay, so so imagine that the leader. Um, let me get this right. So what the leader is going to do is they're going to set their price. They're going to set. It, they're going to make it so that the price is equal to the marginal cost of the the follower. So what happens when price equals marginal cost of the for the follower? That means they make zero profits. Right. If if I'm the leader and I I produce the exact right amount that the price is equal to your marginal cost, and let's say you're the follower, you're gonna make zero profits. And now you're the follower, let's say you were initially producing zero, you're already making zero profits because your, your price margin is zero, is, is nil. If you produce a little bit more, what's gonna happen? Well, you're gonna push the market price down. So now your price margin is gonna be negative and you're gonna be producing stuff, which means you're still, you're losing money. You have a negative price margin times a positive quantity, you're, you're, you're losing money. Producing more, you're only going to dig your dig yourself in deeper. You're going to push the price down more. Okay, so so your options are produce zero, and then you have like a zero price margin and zero quantity. Well, that's zero profits. And if you try and produce anything, you push the price down and you make negative profits. Okay, so so the leader has kind of made it so that you have no choice or that, that you have no profitable options. The best thing you can possibly do is 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 not to produce. Okay, so it's like war games. The the the, the best possible movie is not to play at all. Okay, so uh, it's like a movie from the eighties. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's the, that's what you do. That's what the leader does. They price out the, the follower. Now the leader, remember, if the if the price is equal to the follower's marginal cost, the leader has a lower marginal cost. In which that means their their price margin, their price minus marginal cost is positive, and they're producing something, and so they're making profits. They're fine. And so they're just going to set that they're going to set the price uh, uh, low enough that the follower doesn't want to enter. And to set the price low enough, you just have to produce enough, right? Because, sorry, I didn't mention in this in this world when epsilon equals one, that means pi equals pi yi equals y, okay? Which is going to mean, um, well, it's going to mean two things. It's going to mean pi is uh, y over yi. Or it's going to mean you know y i it's y over p i those you know they're equivalent okay so but in particular let's say like for this one 
they're going to, all they have to do is produce enough YI to push the price PI down to the um, marginal cost of their competitor. Competitor says, okay, I'm done, I'm out. And you just, you keep your price there. You still have to keep your price there to make sure the competitor doesn't ent enter. Because then if you then start producing less and your price goes up, then the competitor will be like, oh, now I want to enter. So that's where the Nash kind of thing is going in. So the equilibrium is you produce at this limit price, which is, you know, the limit price is, say super L, is the marginal cost of the uh, competitor, which is, you know, lambda W over QI. Okay, so that's your limit price. You set that. Competitor is, is, says I'm out and you stay there. Okay. Uh, you, you, you don't want to go to a, uh, higher price because then your competitor might enter. You don't want to go to a lower price because you're going to lower your profits. You're still left to your own devices. would still go cr full on crazy amount, you know, like, you know, like set, uh, infinite price and zero quantity left to your own devices. You would still want to do that, but you have this competitor, right? So you, you don't actually uh, like the only thing stopping you from, from, uh, raising your prices is, is the need to keep out your competitor. Okay. And then you wouldn't want to lower the price, uh, any further though, because you'd only lower your profits. Okay. So you're just going to do it. You're just going to set your price just low enough to keep out that, that competitor. All right. So it gives you a specific prediction. And then, um, you know, then that means that YI, say YI super L is going to be, you know, Y over PI super L from that, that, um, inter, from that demand function. So it's going to be, uh, you know, Y times QI over, um, lambda W. Okay. Um, all right. So oh, I went over time, you know, okay. So what, what does this all add up to? Well, it turns out if you, if you, if you, you can do this on your own, but, and we'll do it next time. If you, if you look at the profits, they end up looking like this. You, if you plug all that YI and PI into your, into a profit function, you're going to get something that looks like this. You're going to get, um, basically, if you look at this profit function, when Lambda is equal to one, you get no profits because you have no, you haven't, you haven't improved technology at all. It's, it's a uh, Bertrand competition with, with equal productivities. Everyone gets zero profits. Uh, if, as Lambda goes to infinity, your, your technological lead goes to infinity, you get, you know, your profits are Y. The profit share is one basically. Um, okay. And that's, um, that's the, the other limit. Okay. So, so you, you, you span the space from zero to, to, to maximal profits and it all depends on your, your step size. Okay. Uh, Lambda. Okay. So that's it. I'm, I'm a little over time here, so I'll stop now, but we'll, we'll go through, you know, I'll, I'll go through how you drive that pi I next time. And then <clears throat> from there, it's just sort of, you know, value, free entry, all that stuff, find an equal.